Hello, I'm Jackson Bird, and as of this month, I am officially five years post top surgery. Now, because at five years, not much has changed, and honestly, it's not something I think about very often, I didn't think an update video would be super interesting, so instead, I took to my Instagram and YouTube community tab to ask you what you want to know about top surgery and my experiences. But just a few points on my top surgery before we get started. So I had double incision top surgery in 2016. I was about eight months on testosterone at the time. It was something I always knew that I wanted even before I knew it was a thing. I have never once regretted the decision. It absolutely improved my quality of life. I paid for it entirely out of pocket in part because I have health insurance through the marketplace, aka Obamacare, and when I got top surgery it was like right at the time or a couple months before my state started covering gender affirming procedures and because it didn't cover gender affirming care at that point there actually weren't that many surgeons in my area of New York City. There are a lot of really good ones now but there weren't at the time. So I went out of state, I paid out of pocket with uh, all of the various expenses and follow-up appointments and travel and everything put together, I paid just over $8,000. So those are the basics. We'll probably get into some more of all of that as I look to your questions. And one more thing about questions is since a lot of people were asking kind of personal questions about themselves, maybe wanting to have top surgery, I decided not to show or say any names or screen names, even though there's public comments, some of them. I still wanted to respect their privacy, so no names will be said, but you know, if I answer your question, you know, you'll know if you know. All right, so here we go. I'm gonna check out the community tab first. So the first question is how bad was dysphoria before top surgery versus after it? My chest was one of the parts of my body I was the most dysphoric about, so pretty bad. Um, and I would say it's like almost completely gone. I think I have a little bit of like self-esteem body image stuff, but honestly a lot more of that comes from my hips. It's like the overall package of my torso, it's my hips that really bother me. Um, and that's something that can't really do anything about. I know that there are like masculinization procedures, kind of like liposuction for your hips, but for me, it's it's like my bones and my frame, really. And that is one thing, is you know, when you have top surgeries, sometimes your dysphoria for other parts of your body can get worse. I know a lot of people who like their bottom dysphoria got a lot worse. It was something that didn't really concern them too much before, but then after getting top surgery, it did. So for some people, it absolutely can help get rid of dysphoria. As with all parts of transition, it's not for every Everyone. You're just really gonna spend a lot of time, you know, thinking about these things and how you feel and the relationship to your body and really knowing yourself. But yeah, for a lot of us, it does really help. Next question. How long after post-op were you completely reliant on others? Did someone need to stay with you? Like, when did you gain enough arm mobility back to be able to dress yourself and brush your teeth and such? I was actually very surprised that for me, I was pretty much able to dress myself, brush my teeth, wash my face. I had like T-Rex arms, like I could, I could move in this way. It was like this kind of muscle, sort of like pinching and grabbing things was maybe hard and like definitely couldn't, couldn't go like higher than here for the first several days to a week. But I was, I was very surprised and, and fortunate that I was able to do most things myself. I could go to the bathroom on my own. I needed a little bit of help like pulling my pants up all the way and maybe like getting shirts on. You definitely want to wear just like zip ups and button downs um, for the first like week or so because you're probably going to be bandaged up and stuff and like putting your arms up to put your arms through a t-shirt no way. But like, yeah, the movement of like trying to get the sleeves on, I needed help with. So I did have help. Um, I saved up to be able to have my mom come stay with me. So she was there for the day of surgery and like three or four days afterwards. I was on my own for a little bit after that and we had kind of rigged up my apartment. So anything that I needed from high shelves, we brought down and put on the table. We put a towel around the handle of the refrigerator so that I like could pull it more easily because that was like a force that was a little too hard for me to open without some assistance. I had neighbors come over to take my garbage out and help me with some dishes. But overall I was like fairly self-sufficient, a little bit more than I was anticipating, which was good. Everyone's experience Experiences are gonna vary. Definitely make sure ahead of time that you do have someone who can be there with you. If you don't have someone who can stay with you the whole time, do your best to get, you know, neighbors and friends, whoever you've got around to maybe like sign up in kind of a spreadsheet and take shifts coming by to help you out with things. Even if you have a partner or a parent who's there taking care of you, um, try to get other people to come help out too so that all of the burden isn't on that one person. But also you will most likely not be completely incapacitated. You'll be able to get up and, and move around and do a couple of things yourself. Next question, did you ever get post-op depression? If so, when did it hit and how did it manifest? I was so ready for post-op depression. I had heard about it and I have a history of anxiety and depression so I was so sure that it would happen to me and it 
didn't. Like maybe a little, but definitely not in a big enough way that I remember it. But I was very prepared for it to happen. So some of the things that you can do to prepare for it, one is write yourself a letter beforehand that, you know, is talking to yourself about why you did this, why you're an awesome person, why your gender is valid, whatever you think you might need to hear. Write it all down in a letter and also in that letter or somewhere else, you know, put things together like a playlist of songs that will make you happy, some TV shows or movies or YouTube videos or podcasts or books. Uh, that you know will cheer you up to read. Have all of that prepared ahead of time. Have a list of people that you can call to talk to. Maybe some support lines if you don't have too many people you feel comfortable talking to. And you know, if you can, prepare a couple of like snacks or treats. Like I think I bought my favorite candy bar and I got these like weird gold bendy straws that I knew would just make me happy when I was staying hydrated in my recovery. Any little thing like that that can kind of cheer you up. And if you do have a history of depression or anxiety. I mean, make sure that you are on your meds if that is part of your treatment. Maybe talk to your therapist, your psychiatrist ahead of time about any extra tips that they might have and any extra support that they can provide. And again, if you have a history, you know what things work for you. So make those things a priority. One challenge I hear a lot is that for a lot of people working out, getting physical activity is part of their like mental health support plan for themselves and you can't do as much of that when you're recovering. So the first few days might be rough on that front, so make sure you have other ways that you can help yourself out. But also after the first few days, you will probably be able to take some walks if you go with a friend who can look after you and you go very slow, but at least you're getting fresh air, you're going out, you're walking around. I know it's not the same as like pumping iron at the gym or going to run five miles, but it's something. Um, and so look at those small ways that you can be getting some activity if that's a really important part of your mental health support. Oh, and I will just say one more thing, the post-op depression thing, um, I am, first of all, not a medical expert, should have said that at the start. <laughs> this is all just my own experience. From what I read, maybe there's some part of it that's sort of like dysphoria induced, um, and just, you know, the weird psychology of like, a major thing happened to your body while you were asleep. Like, you went to sleep, you woke up, your body changed. Wow, your brain's gotta process that. But then also, I have heard that anesthesia, not just in this procedure, but any procedure with anesthesia, sometimes it can cause a little bit of depression in some people. So that's part of it too, like, it's not all trans-related, necessarily. But overall, yeah, like surgery is a big deal. So it makes sense to be nervous. It makes sense that it might cause your brain to do some weird things as you're recovering. So my advice is just be prepared. It might not happen. You might be completely fine and not have any post-op depression or any kinds of things at any point, but better to be prepared with a support plan and things that can cheer you up and make you feel a little bit better. Okay, I have a question about nipple sensation, which I'm always uncomfortable talking about, but it's a big thing people are concerned about. I was very concerned about it. I would kind of put it in the bucket of things that I was so concerned about ahead of time and then just like haven't really thought about afterwards. There are a lot of things with top surgery like that where I was very, very worried about something and then just like it's never been an issue. So nipple sensation can really vary from person to person. So with the keyhole and peri areolar, et cetera, types of top surgeries that can be done on people with smaller chests, in those ones, the like, nerves and stalk of the nipple are like preserved during the surgery. So you have a much better chance of all types of sensation remaining in your nipples with that one. With double incision, like I got the nerves of the nipples are literally severed as the nipples are like moved up higher on your chest. So that all has to kind of like grow back together or something. I am not a scientist, but your odds, it's a little bit riskier on what kind of sensation you might still have. And also of note, like when I say sensation, there's multiple different kinds. There's like pain, if you get like hit or something, there's temperature, you know, when it's real cold and your nipples might get a little hard. There's just touching it, like can you feel things here? And then there's, you know, the erogenous, sexy kinds of sensation. The vast majority of people who get double incision get some type of sensation, but I've seen it really vary on what types and how much of what types. So for me, the tactile and the, the pain kind, so like touching it and feeling pain is still weird. Like I, I can feel it if I were touching my skin. Well, I can, and I can feel it right now. I can feel the pressure. Um, but there's definitely still like numbness in some parts. It's really weird. Like there can even sometimes be like, I feel an itch here, but it's here, or le like things are in weird places. And I've heard that from other people too. Like the nerves rerouted or something, that's probably not a thing, I don't know. But yeah, it's it's really weird and it's really tough to describe. And like if you get an itch in, in any of these areas, it feels almost impossible to scratch it because you scratch it and that's like the only times you notice like, oh, there's some numbness because you're not 
getting the the satisfaction from the scratch. Temperature wise, definitely a thing. Um, my my nipples respond to cold temperatures. As far as the erogenous sides of things, that's getting into territory I'm not too comfortable speaking about. But also. Eh, Definitely not as much as before for me, but like maybe a little maybe it's psychological eh, I'm I'm not really sure but yeah, definitely not as much as before and I, that was like kind of a concern that I had before top surgery But like I do not care like I would not trade this Yeah, that was important to me before and it's not as big a part of my experience of my chest now but like my overall experience of my chest is just a million times better so it just pales in comparison. I, I, I don't care enough about that for me to have any kind of regret over the surgery that I had. This question says, when did your chest look healed up? The scabs gone and stuff. Since I had mine four weeks ago, it still hasn't healed up and I see pics of guys who had it the same day or day after and the results look so far ahead of mine. I get that everyone heals differently, but still. Okay, so I don't remember exactly, but I feel like four weeks or longer, yeah, it definitely took a little bit longer for all the scabs and stuff to go away. I know I had a stitch that like got stuck that I had to go back to the doctor to have taken out. Um, I think my skin generally does heal a little bit slowly when it comes, I am like touching my nipples for so much of this video, just, uh. But yeah, my, my skin I think heals a little bit more slowly. I mean, clearly I am like super pale. I have very sensitive skin and I scar pretty bad. We'll talk more about that in a bit. So yeah, it took me longer. I mean, you're in the right mindset to not compare yourself to people online. They might have had a different procedure altogether. Their surgeon might have different tactics. You will heal up. If you think it's getting really bad, I mean, don't be scared to call up your doctor and ask. Like if you've got bad bruising, especially talk to your doctor. You wanna double check, nothing is wrong, but probably you're okay. It will heal up eventually. Your body is just different than other people's and all of our bodies are different. And I would say it took several months, maybe, probably, before it stopped looking like a fresh cut and more like scars. Okay, let's move on to Instagram. I think I got a lot more questions there. I'm not gonna get to everybody's question. I'm so sorry, but... Oh, I love this question because I assume it is coming from maybe a cis healthcare worker. What would you have liked healthcare workers to have done differently? I think I had a pretty good experience. Uh, overall, definitely good. On the trans side of things, I don't think there was anything, like there was no point where I felt unaffirmed. In fact, I hadn't legally changed my name yet and without even asking them, like the bracelet and stuff I got all had my preferred name on it. I was really lucky. I definitely have friends who have not had as good of experiences. Also, especially a lot of my non-binary friends, um, doctors will just immediately assume he, him pronouns and be like, yeah, dude, man, buddy, all the kind of, and I get it, like those doctors assume they have a trans guy in front of them and are trying to be extra affirming, but not everyone who gets top surgery is a guy. <laughs> a lot of non-binary people do, so healthcare workers would just like definitely make sure that you know the actual gender and pronouns and everything of the patients that you're treating and respect those. I think the biggest thing overall is just respecting your patient. Don't make it seem like this is a weird or unusual procedure. I felt like I was being spoken to as as a fellow equal adult the whole time. And I definitely know people who do not feel like that when they are in doctor's offices or going through procedures like this. So just like, no matter who your patient is, treat them with respect as if they are an equal. And remember that like, it's their body. And so they probably know what they're talking about when they're saying they're experiencing certain things or experiencing pain and like believe them. But I'm probably preaching to the choir if you were asking this or watching this video. So just spread the word to your colleagues. So here's a question, how long are the incisions painful for? And I've gotten a lot of questions just generally about pain. I remember not being in as much pain as I thought I might be, and also like not as out of it as I expected to be, but also maybe I expected it to be a lot worse. And my, like I healed very well. A lot of my friends have had a lot more pain and complications. I was very lucky. I just had things pretty easy. And I do remember of like what I actually felt was just being pretty sore, especially because I had very tight bandages, like an ace bandage wrapping around my chest that I wasn't supposed to take off until I went to my one week uh, follow-up appointment. That and the drains hurt pretty bad. It was more like uncomfortable. Drains don't hurt. They look scary. They look freaky. When you're actually going through it, it's, it's not as freaky and scary as it seems, but it does get uncomfortable after several days. If you have them in for a full week, ugh, it's just like you're itching all over and you, you can't move in as many ways as you want. Like the best part of recovery was when I got the drains out. The actual experience of getting the drains out, 
It was the worst pain I've ever been in in my life. I don't know anyone else for whom it hurt so bad. A lot of people say they don't even feel it. It maybe feels like a weird thing. To me, it hurt really bad. I don't know why. But after they were out, I felt so much more free. Honestly, there's so much numbness that a lot of it doesn't hurt. Like I would have never described the incisions as hurting. It's more just like general soreness and itchiness. Got so many questions from people who are about to have top surgery like in a couple of weeks or next month and that's super exciting. Very happy for all of you. One person specifically asked what to do the morning of to get their mind ready. So I had the very first appointment of the day which was awesome because most doctors all maybe make you fast ahead of time. So like I hadn't eaten since dinner the night before um, and I was really hungry and I think you can't even have water or chapstick or gum or anything. So the less amount of time that I had to do that, the better. But I did have to get up very early in the morning. So I basically woke up and headed to the hospital. But before we headed out, I remember I like filmed a little thing for Snapchat and like checked my messages and I had a lot of people sending me their well wishes, which was very nice and that helps. So, you know, if you've got people in your life who know this is something you're gonna be doing and they're supportive, like, maybe somehow encourage them to send you along little words of encouragement because that can help cool some of your stress or nerves ahead of time. I also did a lot of push-ups that morning. Uh, and part of it was because I was like, kn I knew I wouldn't be able to do push-ups again for like a couple months. And the other part was because I was trying to work off some of the nervous energy. So, you know, you're probably gonna be fasting so you're not gonna have too much like strength and energy in you, but maybe that will help you if you can, you know, run around in circles for a while or do some sit-ups or something to work off some of that nervous energy. Or maybe you've got music that would either calm you down or pump you up and just generally getting in that, that mindset of some, you know, positive thinking and reminding yourself why you're excited for it and why it's gonna be so good for you and that everything is gonna be fine and that your doctor has done this so many times and that it's all gonna be good and that maybe if by some small chance something does go wrong, you can deal with it, you can handle it, you will ultimately be okay. Just remind yourself of some of those things. And pretty soon, you'll be being knocked out and then you'll wake up and it'll all be over. And if you're me, you'll feel very, very nauseous. Which I feel like I had a question about nausea and now I can't find it, um, but I will just say I am super prone to nausea from like everything. So when I heard that some other people can experience nausea from the anesthesia specifically, I also saw recommendations online that you can ask the anesthesiologist to put in some type of thing into it that is like an anti-nausea thing. I'm still unclear if this is real because I tried to ask the anesthesiologist about this and she just kind of like nodded to me. At least that's my memory. Maybe I was already on some drugs at the point so I don't remember. But yeah, I'm unclear if that is actually a thing and if they used it for me. But I do know when I woke up, I was super, super nauseous. I didn't throw up, but I felt like I was going to and there was just like a nurse nearby who sort of helped me um, and like fed me ice chips and stuff. I think for me, it's cause like my blood pressure really plummeted. I, I have low blood pressure already. And sometimes when I lose blood or experience pain, my blood pressure goes down a lot. So I think that's what it was for me. But talk to your doctor about it um, because maybe this thing that gets added into the anesthesia is real. If it is or not, maybe they have some tips on other things that you can do to make sure that you don't feel nauseous or to feel better when you are feeling nauseous afterwards. But I didn't really, there was no other part of the recovery process where nausea was an issue. It was just waking up from surgery. And relatedly, here's a question for post-op. Do you remember if you were super out of it and in pain or super numb and relaxed? I was nauseous, I was pretty out of it. I don't know how long it took me to like feel normal, but I did start feeling more like myself, like slowly, progressively over a period of time. It might've been like an hour. I don't really know. So I did not have a great sense of time, but also there wasn't a clock around anywhere. I didn't really feel in pain. I think I probably felt kind of like heavy and sore and very tired. I was pleasantly surprised that I had more energy than I expected to. And I was a lot more lucid than I thought I would be. Like I knew who I was. I knew where I was. I had an appetite, which surprised me. Like after we were cleared to leave the hospital and we went back to the recovery center, I had my mom go out and buy us food because I was starving. There was also a question about like, someone said that they were very tired throughout their whole recovery process and was I as well? Yeah, I mean, I was. I was taking two to three naps a day and like sleeping a lot through the night for the first several days. But I think that's what you should do when you're recovering. When you are sick, when you are recovering from something, the number one best thing that you can do is just rest. Let your body sleep. If you can't sleep, still just lay there. I mean, I know now these days we all will watch Netflix or we'll listen to podcasts and music or we'll read books or whatever, but honestly, like my grandma raised us on when you were sick, you sit in bed and you do nothing. You're not even supposed to stimulate your brain any, any way. You just like lay there until you recover. And honestly, 
you recover so much better that way. Like it's really what's good for you. And I've, I've done that to certain extents when I've recovered from things like wisdom tooth surgery. And my dentist was like, wow, I have never seen someone recover this well. So there's something to it. But yes, it's absolutely normal to feel tired. You should feel tired. Your body has been through a trauma. It needs to heal. It needs all the energy to focus on healing. So you should feel tired. And if you feel tired, you should sleep. And that, that gets back to the sort of preparing and budgeting thing. But to the extent that you are able to like take plenty of time off of work, even if you were in a work from home situation as more and more of us are nowadays, don't go back to work just because you can do it from bed. Make sure you take several days where you are just focused on your recovery and sleeping. That is what your body needs and you will heal so much better if you do. And I know not everyone has paid time off, so that's part of the budgeting. If you're like, okay, I, I know my body, I think I need two weeks off to recover, but I'm not gonna get paid for two weeks off, then part of what you need to save up for is your living expenses and bills and all of that for those two weeks that you're not having income coming in. Oh my gosh, okay, I just wanna like answer every question, but this is gonna be the longest video in the world if I do, so we'll just do a few more. Um, how quickly do you get used to being shirtless around other people? This is a really interesting question. I think people that really knew me for a long time before, it was kind of uncomfortable at first. Still generally uncomfortable around my family. I don't think I've ever been shirtless around, definitely not my dad, maybe not my brother. Like that would all feel really weird still five years later. But people that I either didn't know too well, that I hadn't been swimming with before, or like new people that I met, fine. Don't, don't really feel anything weird about it. When I'm in some public settings like a beach or a public pool and there are children around especially, I can get nervous about uh, my scars. I mean, I have never been questioned about them. No one has ever asked, but I feel like if an adult were to ask me, I would just say like, I had surgery, I don't wanna talk about it or something like that. And adults know to shut it down, most of them. But kids are curious, they're gonna keep asking questions and I'm just like, I never know what to do. Literally when my scars were more visible, there was a time that I was like at a hotel pool with my friends and we were in the hot tub and a kid came and was just like hanging around and I stayed in the hot tub underwater until the kid left. I was like getting, I was like starting to get lightheaded from being in the heat for too long, but I was too scared for him to see my scars. And so I just stayed underwater. So, but they've, they've faded a lot at this point. You can definitely still see them. And sometimes I see people's like eye lines go towards them. And yeah, like my hips are pretty prominent. So that sometimes I'm a little bit self-conscious about when I'm shirtless around people. And then I have like normal body image things. But yeah, mostly I just feel like a normal guy who's like a little bit uncomfortable with what the top of his body looks like as a lot of my cis guy friends feel too. Most guys do not look like the ones on Instagram and in the magazines. And I think a lot of us feel pressure that we should. And this is cis guys and trans guys. Like, I don't think it's good, but I think it's normal to feel a little self-conscious, I guess, as a dude about what you look like with your shirt off. So I just sort of own it in the same way that any other guys do. But also like, yeah, there's a reason I'm not taking my shirt off right now and that I don't post a bunch of like, shirtless pics on Instagram. Um, I mean, that's just kind of not who I am. And it just feels a little weird to me. I mean, I do walk around with my shirt off all the time at home. And like when I'm home alone, like when my roommate's gone, I basically never have a shirt on. So <laughs> here's a good question. Favorite nipple? Never really thought about it. Maybe this one? I don't know, like, I, just, I, I don't know why. I guess you don't need to know why. I'm gonna say this one is that the right, my right, my right one is my favorite. I've got a lot of questions about like reducing scars and generally caring for your scars and your nipples after recovery. I talked about uh, some of that in one of the older top surgery videos I did. So I'll link to that here. I don't remember if I mentioned in that one or not, but sort of like massage, once they're healed, massaging your scars every day as you put different lotions or serums or whatever you choose to do on them is the biggest thing that I found helpful over the years and I wish I had done more of it from the beginning because it really just sort of like breaks down the collagen or whatever. Um, I feel like that's what made my scars fade a lot. But the biggest thing is just time. I get scars from pimples and bug bites, so I knew that mine were never gonna be completely gone and they definitely weren't gonna be gone really quickly. It depends a little bit on your surgeon, but like most of it is your body um, and how your body reacts to scars and recovery in general. The last question that I'm gonna answer is, were you scared your top surgery wouldn't look good? I would put this as another thing in the bucket of something that I was really worried about ahead of time and then just hasn't 
really been an issue. I mean, I was scared there would be some type of complication. There, I mean, of course it's scary. You're like being put to sleep and someone's like literally changing your body with scalpels and stuff while you're asleep and then you wake up and you're just left with whatever happened. That's scary. But that's why you do your research. You pick a surgeon you feel comfortable with and whose results you have seen and, and you feel good about and you just have confidence and yes, something could go wrong. There are small complications that can happen to a lot of people, and a very rare few people have had larger complications, but you've just gotta tell yourself that you can take whatever happens, and if you can't, like, yeah, maybe top surgery isn't for you. If, if you are so concerned that having a bad outcome from top surgery would be worse than what you currently have, then maybe top surgery isn't for you. Because that's what it ultimately came down to for me, was Whatever happens from top surgery, I'm going to be closer to the chest I've always felt like I should have than I am now, I said to myself pre-surgery. And that's totally how I feel. Like, I never once regretted it. It never felt weird. Like, I regretted cutting my hair the day after I did it, uh, when I first did the big cut on my hair. I never once regretted having top surgery. What my chest was before felt so foreign and wrong on my body. So even now that I have like a couple of like insecurity issues and like the scars, sometimes I'm like, oh, that's like, I feel a little disconnect with that or something like that. Like this is just so, it feels so much more natural and normal to what my body should feel like. That like, I forget that it was ever different. And it's not my perfect result. My perfect result would have been if I qualified for peri and had no scars whatsoever, or if my scars were like a little bit smaller or faded completely or something like that. And like, you know, sometimes I realize my nipples don't look completely perfect. There are so many ways that it could be better and could be more of my ideal, but I am very lucky that nothing went wrong. But overall, just, yeah, like no regrets. I feel so much better. For me, it was exactly what needed to happen. Maybe that's not the case for everyone. So do your research, know yourself, really think things through. If it's not right for you, work on how you can accept that. If it's not available to you for maybe medical reasons or whatever, work on how you can accept that. And if it is what's right for you, then you've got a lot of work to do on saving and budgeting and figuring out how to get it done. But there are so many other videos on YouTube and so many resources online to help you out. And if you are someone for whom this type of top surgery is not at all relevant to you and you stuck around this long, first of all, congrats. Thank you for, you know, educating yourself a little bit by hearing someone else's perspective. For everyone, if you have further questions or I didn't address your questions, you can watch some of the other videos that I've made on top surgery, both generally and about my experiences. Links on the screen, maybe definitely in the description box. I also talk about it at length in my book, which you can request from your local library, or you can buy it in paperback or hardcover or ebook or audiobook read by moi. And hey, if for some reason you want to hear even more from me, you can subscribe and hit the bell to get notified for new videos and also listen to my podcast every single weekday. I host the Kotki Ride Home, which is a 15 minute podcast about some of the coolest things in the news that day, science, history, weird internet stuff. You can listen to it wherever you get podcasts and here on YouTube, links to all of that is in the description box. I know this video was lacking in some of the primer and 101 stuff, and I know there are so many questions on so many different aspects of this that I did not get to yet, so definitely check out the other top surgery videos that I've made and resources that I put in the description box. But this video is far long enough, so we are going to end it here and I just want to say thank you so much to all of you who have supported me over the years and thank you for watching this and I will see you next time.